Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, and it is chapter 18. Um, well, I'm, I'm getting echo back at me. I don't know what's going on. But uh, we have, we're in chapter 18, Patricia. And it is, uh, welcome, everybody. As always, um, I love your cards and letters. And, and those of you, and I don't want to put anybody's name out there because I think if you're, if you're sending me gifts or cards, you're, that's private. And uh, if you want me to announce your name, I'll do it. But other than that, just know that I can thank you privately and that it's a, you're given before God. But uh, I've had some, some pretty amazing books show up in my mailbox, uh, some that weren't even on my list. And uh, pretty cool to have come in there and some cards and letters. Bill is reporting from heaven, Echo. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. I started picking up this Echo last week, and I don't know what's happening. So... Uh, I wonder if I can shut off my, let me turn off my uh, volume on my end. Is that better? 
Is it is the echo gone if I do this? Because I can see the uh, the levels. I just won't hear what's happening. But five five in the chat. Anybody? Do you hear me when I mute it? Can we hear? No, nothing. Okay, all right. So I just had to shut off my speaker so I can't hear it. So that's better. Good deal. Then I can turn the volume back up without having an echo hit me in the face. Okay. So my regular email is bill at discerning truths. <coughs> Sorry. I get some great email questions that come in there. And then questions that are more appropriate for the Profit Club. Uh, Profit Club clowns, Michael and I. Um can go to profitclubclowns at gmail.com and then after the study i will uh post the uh the slides up on uh, uh discerning truth group and um anything that comes up on your screen that's a slideshow that has it's louder too volume has been way too low all right yeah um thank you donna I am I'm hopefully fix this. I don't know what caused the echo to start, but as long as we get rid of it, we're good to go. And um, I was having to turn the volume down to not have the echo come crazy on my end. And uh, so I can turn it back up and uh, everybody can hear. And then, uh, yeah, the, so at Discerning Truth Group on Telegram, you don't have to take notes of all the any scriptures I've referenced because they're all going to be up there for you. And then uh, my normal schedule is Monday and Wednesday. I do, I'll do. i be doing Isaiah until we finish Isaiah. Uh, Friday, I usually do something different. And then Tuesday, I'm normally on with Neil. Neil is playing her first ever stream tomorrow, replaying it. So I'm not going to be on with her. So I'm going to do a special um, stream at my regular time, noon tomorrow because it's coincidentally my 100th stream since I started. And I know a lot of people don't care about that, but I never expected to make this far. And uh, I'm pretty happy to have done 100 streams and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a special one tomorrow and hopefully you can tune in. And then, uh, but I won't be on with Neo tomorrow, but I tune in and see what she sounded like on her first day and it'd be great. And then as I always start my day with, uh, Miguel California, Michael Beatty, my friend, uh, with his uh, music, worship music in the morning and Proverbs and usually in one book or another, uh, you know, teaching from. I mean, now we're in Second Peter and it just is a uh, an amazing way to start my day. And uh, so I'm hoping that everybody will uh, join me over there. And on Sunday morning, he has his lovely wife, Linda, um, join them and they do their devotional. And that's all at 5.30 Pacific time. It definitely the start of my day. I'm in bed with coffee watching uh, th those uh, streams. And then uh, the Profit Club uh, episode is probably taking a back seat to the work we're doing for the Passover. And and you go, oh, you have the April 15th. And it's coming faster than uh, I want, and uh, we have a lot of work to do to be ready for that study. And so the, the Profit Club programming may take a back seat to that, but we'll announce when there's another one coming. And just because I haven't been uh, promoting other shows, there's some people I took off intentionally that I weren't, I wasn't putting out there because uh, they're either endorsing heretics, teaching heresy, or promoting a the Passion Translation, which is a uh, corruption of scripture. So I just took them off of my promotion list. Uh, there are still other great programs, uh, and I just don't get to promote them very often, but this is a short uh, show. And don't forget, the memers are important to our movement. And uh, Trevor does a great job on Meme TV showcasing the work of the memers. And I'm hoping that uh, everybody will uh, cut in and, and take a... Um, uh, say hi to him and and um, listen to the memes and laugh a little it's it's kind of a fun show so with that i'm going to just jump on a full screen and uh, say hello to everybody i got um clout hub i see my good friend uh lionel over there on uh on facebook 
is uh, sharpening uh, weapons, <laughs> his blades. Is that your two-edged sword, Lionel, sharpening up for the uh, Joe? And then, uh, you know, got a pretty good active chat going on on DLive. Um, I didn't see anybody on Twitch, but I did get notification that we are on Twitch again. So, I don't know. Uh, my one uh, source says it's not working. And then I have... Uh, Yeah. All right. So we're we're um we're back in, into Isaiah 18 and um so with that, I'm hoping you all can uh tune with me and we will uh get started on Isaiah 18. All right. So verses 1 and 2 say ah land of whirring wings that is beyond the rivers of Cush, which sends ambassadors to the sea and vessels of papyrus on the waters. Go ye swift messengers to a nation tall and smooth, to a people feared near and far, a nation mighty and conquering, whose land and rivers divide. Okay, so the question, the first question we got to ask is, who, what country is this being sent to? Cush is the ancient name of Ethiopia, so some of your study Bibles will say this is going to Ethiopia. Um, the problem is it's going to the land beyond the rivers of Cush. And you say, okay, well, beyond which direction, right? You know, uh, some people think it's Egypt because it talks about ambassadors and water, uh, vessels of uh, uh, papyrus on the waters. And uh, papyrus vessels are, are common to Egypt. So, they, that's it. But I'm I'm looking at it from the point of view of Israel. If you're looking back towards Cush, Egypt is first. It's not beyond the rivers of Cush. It's before you get the rivers of Cush. So that gets to be a little bit problematic for me, uh, thinking it's there. Um, the land of Sheba, which actually was in a... Um, Sinai, but sometimes it would uh, conquer and, and have part of Ethiopia. Like I say the Queen of Sheba was, uh, came up and, and gave tithes to Solomon. Um, that can be from that um, same area, but it just, it, it gets a little hard. And then when they talk about the rivers dividing, they think that makes them think of Ethiopia as well, because um, I'm going to present you a picture out of Ethiopia and see if that river doesn't look like it divides the country. I mean, that's a pretty good canyon, the river going down there, the rivers of Kush, those rivers feed into the Nile, and they definitely look like uh, they're dividing the nation. So you have descriptions that could fit Egypt, Ethiopia, or, and then you have this, uh, the, it talks about the land beyond um, Ethiopia, right? And uh, so I'm going to move you to that next. Beyond the rivers of Cush, to a nation tall and smooth, a people feared near and far. And then you go, okay, what's that talking about? Because Ethiopians aren't really tall people. And uh, they're not, they weren't necessarily feared near and far. And then, so I, I looked it up in the, Septuagint to see if it was helping helpful, and the Septuagint reads significantly different. Okay, when it says, "Woe to you, wings of a land of ships beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, the one who sends hostages by sea and papyrus letters over the water, for nimble messages will go to an uplifted nation, and who is beyond the foreign of a harsh people, a hopeless and trampful nation." So that description is completely different. It's one of the places where the Septuagint and the Masoretic text just give you completely different ideas of what's being said. But if we continue south, away from Israel, beyond the rivers of the Kush, we get to Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda down in that corner. And coincidentally, this is the location of many of the tribes considered to be the tallest people in the world, right? Many have very of these tribesmen have very smooth skin. It's almost like black onyx or whatever, polished stone. So uh, some of these tribes, such as the Maasai tribe, 
hunt lions. So they are feared warriors, right? I mean, if you go out and hunt lions as, as you're in your spare time, you're, you're considered kind of a badass by most people. So uh, these tribes are not known for sending out ambassadors anywhere in vessels. They're not known as lands of ships or for conquering other nations. So it's unclear how the rivers divide the land of Kenya. But Kenyan tribes are also known for their speed on foot so that nimble messengers in going to uplift the nation comment in the in the Masoretic, I mean in the Septuagint also seems to fit. But despite all this scholarly debate, we really have no idea who this was sent to and who it's talking about. So understanding how it was fulfilled gets to be a little bit problematic as well. But uh, so chapters 18 and 19 are going to be tough chapters for a couple of reasons. But chapter 18 here is a tough chapter uh, specifically because of this, that uh, there's a big debate among scholars as to who they're even talking to, where the letter went to. Well, how do you know how it was fulfilled if you don't know who got the letter, right? So that just got us two verses into this uh, very short chapter, but um, verses three to six say, all you inhabitants of the world, you who dwell on the earth, when a signal is raised on the mountains, look, when a tri trumpet is blown here, for thus the Lord said to me, I will quietly look from my dwelling like clear heat in the sunshine, like a cloud over the dew in the heat of harvest. For before the harvest, when the blossom is over and the flower becomes ripening grape, he cuts off the sh shoots and the pruning hooks and uh, the spreading of the branches he lops off the uh, clears away. They shall all of them be left to the birds of prey in the mountains and of the beasts of the earth. And the birds of prey will, uh, will summer on them and all the beasts of the earth will winter on them. Okay, so now Isaiah shifts right back <laughs> to this very metaphorical, poetic, figurative language, right? Um, he is, not he, I. He is presenting. I always love this because I can find my spelling errors when I'm reading them to you, right? He's presenting the coming judgment against the nation as pruning, right? As pruning. There you go. The unripe or sour grape is of no use to the owner of the vineyard. And if you remember from the parables, the owner of the vineyard is God. He prunes off the undesired branches and the sour fruit, leaving them for food for the birds or other animals. This, it, this is a very graphic picture of people who do not seek after God being cut off and discarded like useless garbage. And you think, oh, God seems so mean doing that. God bent over backwards, sent his only son to save us. He did everything in his power to, to cause us to turn to him. Everything except for actually uh, taking away our free will, right? He's not forcing us into heaven. He, he's done everything short of turning us into robots to make us follow him to get us to go to heaven. And if people choose still to ignore him, and to, and to uh, deny his his grace and his offer and his amazing gift from God, then that's how they're going to be pictured as like discarded, useless garbage, right? But what remains is the desired fruit or remnant is, is implied by the imagery here. So the prophet doesn't even need to state the fact that he's talking about a remnant, right? He's doing it through imagery. But again, we see that the idea of the remnant being preserved that the good grapes are preserved the good grapes are, are taken in the good fruit is taken in the undesired fruit and undesired branches are left to go and they're left for food for the animals or whatever right so that kind of idea of a remnant is all through um isaiah and and he and he does it with imagery sometimes and he does it with actual words other times but he is mostly dealing with uh, imagery. And that's going to be important to us when we get to uh, the Apocalypse of John, known as the Book of Revelation, because John does the same exact thing. He puts out imagery to convey a truth. 
the the imagery is the truth, not the actual the the words aren't meant to be taken as the literal truth. It's the imagery that they're bringing up. Just like you don't see God out there pruning a a grapevine, right? He's he's giving you an imagery of pruning the grapevine to show you what um is is coming, right? That this pruning is going to happen through this judgment and then ultimately in the day of the Lord that's going to happen, right? And then the last verse in this chapter is Isaiah is verse seven, and it says, "At the time of the tribute, uh, at the at at that time should be a comma. The tribute will be brought to the Lord of Hosts from a tall a people tall and smooth, from a people feared near and far, a nation mighty and conquering, whose land the rivers divide, the Mount uh, Zion, the place of the name of the Lord of Hosts." Now you can see how when we looked at the uh, Septuagint, that idea was mixed in into earlier verse. So it's still there. It's just uh, not in the same verse order, right? So we need to ask, at what time? Isaiah is routinely shifted between historical events and a future kingdom, between a judgment that happened sometime shortly after Isaiah to certain nations like Assyria and Babylon and, and uh, Moab, and now this nation of unknown nation is going to be judged in some historical period. And then he shifts without a, a as much as a comma or a period. He shifts and travels thousands of years across history into the, um, the time of the uh, end of the age. And... Um, so at what time will the tribute be brought to the Lord of hosts from the people tall and smooth? And I think it, it's pretty clear from his past pattern that what he's talking about is um, people in the, in the day of the Lord time, bringing in the millennial kingdom time, bringing that tribute, right? So people who favor this prophecy being about Ethiopia or Cush, rather than a nation beyond the rivers of Cush, see the story of Ethiopian eunuch as a fulfillment of that prophecy in Acts 8, 26 to 40. And if that's what this is about, maybe that is the fulfillment. But I think that's this doesn't totally fulfill this passage. It's, it's talking about from the people of that nation bringing tribute to God. And I think that happens in the millennial kingdom, right? And again... We see the reference to a people tall and smooth, as well as being feared near and far. And the descriptions aren't normally associated with the Ethiopians or, or um, people from Cush. So that's why I don't hold that position. But it, this is, I'll just tell you flat out, this is a difficult chapter to understand what he's talking about. So uh, I, I have more to say, and I'm not going away, but I just, uh, I'm going to... Uh, go to a song and then we'll come back and I'll, I'll read the chat and then I'm going to get on to some other issues about Isaiah that I want to uh, talk to you guys about. Okay. So let's, uh, I like this hallelujah video. Let's do this one. Ooh, ooh.
Okay, I'm back. Hopefully back. <laughs> so yeah, Debbie, uh, this, this is a hard chapter. Even for somebody I've studied for years, it was a hard chapter. So reading it in two versions uh, and still not getting what's going on is, is not surprising. And, uh, but it's a, uh, yeah. So, um, the smooth and tall people, I just, I, to me, it's, it's those tall tribes and they have very smooth skin. And it was one of the things I noticed. And, and, um, there's also a, uh, tendency in them and, uh, tribes up in, the, um, in the, Sahara Desert area to have the almond shaped eyes that you see in uh, on Egyptian pyramids of their slaves. They have these very distinctly shaped eyes and that very almond shaped eyes. And I just thought that seems to be uh, common in these people. They're one tall. They ha they typically have the almond shaped eyes. They have very smooth skin. And you know any stereotype always has exceptions i'm just saying in general that seems to be the case and that uh, they're known for um their fast speed on foot so to me it it makes sense but i can't be dogmatic about it i just think the uh, the tribes those tall tribes the maasai and the other tribes in that area are are probably the the place Brain Troll asked, um, don't some scholars say that Africa is a birthplace of humanity? Yeah, that is a, um, a, a position of secular history. Um, I I would uh, have some issues with it. One, it's contrary to the Bible. But two, I watched a special where they looked like the Lucy bone that was supposed to be or hip bone that uh, they found... Uh, um, that supposedly um, pre-humanoid Lucy and um, from the shape of the bone that Lucy couldn't have stood up, stood erect. She would have to have been hunched over. And so they actually cut the bone and twisted it and then glued it back together, the fossil, to, uh, they said, because clearly this bone is wrong, so we're going to just adjust it. And that kind of... Uh, uh, stuff it, it it it's no substitute for real science when you're willing to do that level of corruption but they weren't even hide it they put it right on the video they showed the guy saw the bone and turn it and, and glue it to where they could make lucy stand upright and uh but they're pushing a a narrative that is contrary to scripture scripture has um humanity coming out of the garden we don't know where the garden was at the time, based on the description of the four rivers, uh, the modern rivers that have similar names could be just renaming, like we have New York as a place, you know, and named after New York, or or Memphis, uh, Tennessee is named after Memphis, Egypt, right? You know, you reuse names, so we don't know where the original garden was on the on the planet, and it, you know, I'm not against ideas that the garden could have been in Africa. I just I let the facts lead where the facts are. I'm not trying to move an agenda here. If the facts say that the Garden of Eden was in the area of Mesopotamia, then that's what it was. If it says it was in Africa, that's where it was. And that's what I try to do with your text, is let the text say what it says, instead of coming here with a grid to lay over the text, to read through that grid and to help us follow my perspective, right? It, it, you have to let the text speak for itself. And when, when it's clear that Isaiah is speaking in, in figurative, poetic language, then you read it as figurative, poetic language. When it's clear that he's talking in a historical narrative, then you read it as a historical narrative. He just shifts back and forth fluidly. I mean, just like from one um, genre to another, mid-sentence or, or mid-paragraph and, and goes back and forth. So it takes a little bit more work with Isaiah and some of the other prophets. Uh, Jeremiah does the same thing. So does Zechariah. We'll go in what seems to be historical narrative and then right off into uh, vision type uh, imagery. In uh, the Three Kings analogy about bringing uh, a praying troll, about bringing a uh, tribute, I still think that we're going to give tribute to God and, and, and to Jesus as, as part of that. And imagine... He's set up for 
Israel to live in a theocracy, right? And they failed in their theocracy because it was ran by men. <laughs> and and uh, it's a fact, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? You know, so uh, even a theocracy is not subject, not um, exempt from the corruption of man. But when Jesus is the uh, uh, absolute despot in a theocracy, that he is the monarchy in ruling in, in the kingdom, then you could function in that theocracy. And if we lived under that theocracy, then we would still bring in offerings to the, not because we're seeking um, forgiveness of sins, because that's paid for, but because that's the economy he set up. In many ways, many of the Old Testament offerings are the way they got the food to the market, to the safe way of the day, to the uh, market. It was uh, brought in and a, and a certain percentage was given to the uh, uh, priest and, and to, to run the government, you know, their theocracy. And then it was there for other people to purchase. So there's a lot of this is, has to do with a way to set up an economy. And why would that economy and, and that way to run a, a civilization not be the same when there's a new heaven and a new earth? I don't see any reason for it to uh, go away. There's not going to be animal sacrifices for that purposes because the sacrifice is once and done. But you could still have that kind of economy going on. So I don't I don't see a problem, any kind of uh, uh, issue with that happening. But yeah, thank you for the congratulation on 100 streams. I was uh, just think if I was I was preaching on Sunday morning. I'd be two years into my ministry at this point, you know, 50 weeks a year, that's two years, you'd be out there. So I'm, I'm pretty happy that I got this going on and um, happy how far I've come as far as uh, trying to do these podcasts and um, happy that there's more than three people listening to me, you know, that enough of you are out there, they care about diving a little deeper, getting a, into the meat of God's word, and to understanding God and his word better that you're willing to tune in and spend part of your day with me. I'm very honored and, and humbled that you that is happening. So um, with Isaiah, what I want you guys to notice, and it's, since it's a short chapter, it's a good place to, to remember. He is has often a multiple fulfillment of his prophecies, right? There's a historical fulfillment. There's a spiritual fulfillment in us, how it relates to us in Jesus. And then there is a um, ult ultimate fulfillment in the end of time, right? And so you have those, um, to have that multi-layered fulfillment, oftentimes the easiest way to cover them all is to put them in poetic or symbolic language to where they can apply to all of them. But they don't, you don't read them literally when it's written in symbolic language you're, you're trying to get the imagery out of them to understand so we're going to go to john's apocalypse and kind of deconstruct it go backwards from the uh what john's saying and then look at his imagery when he's quoting or alluding to isaiah ezekiel uh zechariah daniel um psalms he's he's alluding to all these books in genesis and in the bible and go, okay, what was being said in the passage he's alluding to? What imagery is John trying to bring up to us instead of writing out a narrative? What is he trying to make us feel and sense? What, what imagery is going on? And that's how we're going to deconstruct the apocalypse. You don't take your newspaper and then read it and then get the uh, book of Revelation next to you and try to find matches. That's not the way we understand scripture. It's not the way it's ever been done until modern times, you know, where people decided that was a good hermeneutic, uh, a good uh, principle for understanding scripture. Just never done. And uh, so I'm going to try to take what scholars do in very thick books <laughs> in, in very, uh, technical language and explain it back to you in a way that makes sense to you. 
And that's my goal. If I'm successful, uh, you can have a better understanding of both Isaiah and Revelation, right? And hopefully uh, you're having a better understanding of Isaiah already. And uh, so we have that in Isaiah, is that kind of trifold, at least three meanings of, of prophecy, sometimes four. But because uh, sometimes you have uh, types uh, where prophecies are fulfilled in type. And I'll, I'll give you an example of the, uh, the abomination and desolation happened in Daniel. Uh, Daniel predicted it happened in the, in the uh, Maccabean times, right? Where, and then you had it, uh, what do you call it? Not in Maccabeans, the Antiochus Epiphanes. It did the uh, sacrifice the pig on the altar. So you had a, a fulfillment. And then Jesus tells you when you look and see it. So he's looking to the future for that to happen, something that already happened in the past. And that you are, uh, so we have another fulfillment that's coming, whether that's a literal temple and a literal fulfillment, or is he talking symbolic? That's something we'll get into later. I tend to lean on a literal fulfillment of that, that uh, and I lean that direction. I'm not 100% sold that there's a another future temple coming but i think that is the most likely interpretation of the passage right and uh so you have those kind of types and and shadows and multiple fulfillments that come on prophecy you have the the use of symbolic very poetic language to describe things but when you read the poetry you still understand what's true it's talking about true events. It's just doing it in, in poetic language. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a horrible poet, but the one I always use is in a misquote probably, but it says, you know, I awoke on the beach as the first rays of the sun were kissing the water and the uh, waves were lapping the sands of the shore. And you go, okay, well, the sun doesn't have lips. It's not actually kissing the water and the, and the waves don't have a tongue it's not lapping the shore but that poetic language painted a picture for you of what it would be like to awaken on that beach right even though you have a horrible poet trying to <laughs> convey that that's what's happening so you have the same kind of language being used in isaiah the same kind of language being used in in revelation to paint a picture of something and then when you understand like uh, earlier in the book isaiah quoted moses and he's bringing you back to that uh, uh, authority that Moses was was exuding over the people, and Isaiah was was basically trying to speak from that same authority. So he quotes Moses to bring in that that authority to his message. And then when you're studying uh, uh, Proverbs and Solomon, uh, and I don't remember what proverb it is, he talks about uh, don't hide in the doorway. Uh, to do violence, even if uh, you think you have a good reason for it, basically, and that's a paraphrase of the proverb. What he's doing is he's quoting or alluding to an event that happened with his father, David, where uh, Saul sent people in to wait in the doorway to kill him. And so he's emotively bringing up that imagery to people. And you have to understand who he's quoting and what he's quoting for to understand what, what imagery you're supposed to get from that language. And you don't just take it at, okay, I won't hide in the doorway and I won't kill people. I won't do violence that way. You know, he's bringing it up is that even though Saul thought maybe he was doing the right thing, it was wrong for him to do it. But David's a beloved king. And so he pulled on those emotional strings, right? By bringing up that imagery. And that's what we have here in Isaiah. The same kind of thing. And um, so... That's going to happen over and over again. And the next chapter is not long either, but it was not, it was too long for me to try to do two in one time, you know? And then, uh, so, um, with that, I, I think I'm going to land this plane because I got everything out that I needed to do. And, um, like I said, tomorrow at noon, I plan to be back here with, with a uh, special, uh, broadcast. I picked something uh, near and dear to my heart to do on, on my 100th episode and uh, I will get it out there for tomorrow and then Wednesday we'll be back on Isaiah. 
in in uh, chapter 19 and then Friday uh, I'm going to deal with uh, some problems in Christian apologetics and um, some issues that I want to warn you people about and, and what you're doing when you when you're trying to decide who to read and who to listen to and what's what's going on so with that let me uh oh you know what let me play another song before i get out of here because i really love this and then uh, we'll do that and then i'll play my outro song and and we'll see you all later <laughs> So